talk about limitless love, which I'm sure you're all really up for. So uh, this is basically about the development of loving kindness as a meditation practice. And uh, loving kindness is variously translated normally as loving kindness, sometimes as loving friendliness. Um, the Brahma Viharas, of which loving kindness is one, are also talked about as um, protections. And I really like the idea of um, loving kindness being a kind of protective intention towards beings, because we don't always feel particularly friendly or even warm to people, even when we're fairly developed in loving kindness practice. But I think for most of us, we gen generally don't wish harm on another. You know, even poor old Boris Johnson, you know, we all wanted him to get better. Although there are many other people suffering, you know, much more severely with the coronavirus than uh, that don't get onto the news. But, you know, the basic sort of um, movement of heart, I think for most people, almost an instinctive, intuitive aspect of being a human being is that wish to protect life and that wish for all beings to be well, to be happy, to be at peace. You know, may they not suffer from their bad karma, even if they've created plenty. We want to help people to see, you know, where they're harming others. We want to help them come out of that delusion. So there is this sort of innate um, quality which wants to care and protect beings. And of course, in the Buddhist suttas, um, this is developed to a very great level, um, to the point where it's called an apamana state, which means boundless or limitless. So the kind of love that includes all beings equally and impartially, no matter who they are. Yeah. And it feels so wonderful to be around people with this kind of loving kindness, because even if you know that you say have a friendship with that person, you know that that person doesn't favor you any more than someone who they don't get along with. You know, they accept you equally um, and they see your good, but they see everybody's good. And it's just so wonderful to be in a person's presence in that way. I guess the first time I really experienced unconditional love was in Burma with my teacher where I ordained and um, his metta and the way he would, uh, I think actively be sending metta quite a lot, um, would almost feel like I was being showered with this sort of warm sensation of loving kindness, which really put me at ease, body and mind. And because of that, I was able to sit for many hours, you know, long, long hours in meditation. And I just didn't want to leave his presence. I felt so safe and accepted. And it was almost like having a head start with the meditation, you know, because it put me so at ease. So I want to talk about how we can build it and uh, cultivate loving kindness. And that relates to the second two of the right effort or the right endeavor of the Eightfold Path. So this means the endeavor to um, develop the wholesome and increase the wholesome, increase, maintain, cultivate, multiply, and keep on expanding the wholesome qualities in our heart. And also how to develop the meta practice into deep states of samadhi. Now I'll only probably be able to touch on those things, but um, the Buddha says time and again in the suttas that we can only see things as they truly are um, after we experience the complete abandoning of the hindrances. In other words, after states of deep samadhi. So the Pali is samadhi pachya yata bhutanyana dasana, which literally means um, samadhi or stillness of mind, usually translated as concentration, which seems too narrow and limited to me. So I prefer stillness of mind is the cause for seeing things as they truly are. Yeah. So most of the time we think we see things correctly. Of course, we all trust our own perceptions and, you know, um, political viewpoints or judgments of others um, and invest them with quite a lot of truth and reality. But the Buddha is saying that as long as the five hindrances are present, you're not really seeing an accurate picture. You're seeing things which are distorted and bent by those five hindrances, by your craving for what you want to see, for your aversion towards what you don't really want to see. Yeah, and also through delusion, just not having the clarity of mind so that whatever we see is not a true representation. It's very dim and almost blurred in a way. Yeah, so you can see that's, that sometimes in your meditation when the mind's kind of heavy or foggy, the breath is not clear. Even your mental state might not be clear or the sensations might not be clear because the hindrances are obscuring the mind. 
So metta can be a very beautiful practice to help us enter into these deep states of samadhi. And the Buddha said that if it wasn't possible to develop the wholesome states, and if those wholesome states didn't lead to happiness, he wouldn't ask us to do it. This is in the Anguttara, Anguttara 158, for anyone who wants to check it out. Um, and he said, but because it is possible and because it does lead to happiness, he advises, he encourages, he um, urges us to cultivate and develop the wholesome states. So this is something which perhaps isn't taught very much to us in the West through our education systems or, I don't know, even in psychology. I think there's a field of psychology called positive psychology now, which maybe does talk a bit more about cultivating or emphasizing the qualities we have, the goodness. But it's very rarely talked about as something we can cultivate. You're either a kind person or you're not. You know, you're a generous person or you're not. But the Buddha's saying we can work on this. We can expand that capacity for good. And there are ways to bring that forth and to bring that into our lives, into our physical actions, mental actions, and, um, and verbal actions, yeah? So it's following on from last week, for those who are here, I just wanted to recap a little bit on um, what we did last week, because we talked about virtue as the first foundation of practice, and that included virtue of body, speech, and mind. And we talked about virtue as a way to develop ourselves personally, but also as a way to bring about harmony and community. So I referred to a sutta about the six principles of cordiality. There are also suttas on 10 principles, and I think that's as far as it goes. But the six, which I really love to bring up, are um, verbal, mental, and bodily actions with loving kindness, both in public and in private. And the last three are sharing, sharing one's food, which I'm sure many of us are trying to do right now, or maybe people are sharing their food with us if we're vulnerable, or if we're a nun, they're definitely sharing food with me, so I'm getting nice and chubby. <laughs> and, uh, chubby, uh, I should say. And, uh, and the next one is sharing virtue in common with one's fellows in the holy life, or one's fellow meditators, or even family members. It's nice if we share the same values. It makes for harmony. And the last one is to share um view share our view in common so the buddha talks about right view as basically comprising the four noble truths and other things too but starting there is good enough this appreciation that there is suffering that beings suffer and obviously with the coronavirus we're seeing that in its stark reality you know things like sickness and death are often seem a little bit distant from us until we encounter them or until we hear about such things as global pandemics and see the numbers topping up every day. You know, I think England had its highest probably today. I didn't check the figures, but we're certainly, um, I think, surpassing even Italy's highest days at this point of, in terms of numbers of deaths daily. You know, and this is not only due to the fact that there's a pandemic, it's also due to the fact that we're born into this human world and we're subject to sickness. So even practicing loving kindness is not going to help us avoid that sickness unless it takes us all the way out of rebirth, basically. You know, yes, it may boost our immune system, but there are certain things we're subject to. And that can be an incentive to deepen these qualities of love in ourselves. It's not a reason to move away from that, turn away from that. It's actually more of a wholesome motivation, a wholesome motivating factor to really start to plant these seeds of loving kindness in our heart. And then at the next point, we talked about um, guarding the senses, and using attention, using perception in a way that stimulates and encourages the wholesome qualities to arise in our mind. So I don't know about people that I'm looking at here, but um, you know, this is really important when we're living with people in close proximity, that we start to see the best in them and give them the benefit of the doubt, you know, in a way, turn a blind eye to their faults at times, unless you're in a really, really balanced state of mind where you can point it out gently and kindly. And also living alone, you know, it's important to focus on what we do have rather than dwelling on the fact that we're isolated and can't go here, can't meet this person, can't get this food or whatever it is that you have to let go of. You know, the fact that we had a beautiful day today here in England and yesterday I went out into the local park and I was really moved almost to tears just by the abundance and beauty of nature, all the cherry blossoms and the little leaves coming out. And it was almost overwhelming. 
And afterwards I realized it's because this kind of situation really highlights those things that we have to appreciate, you know, because there's not such a, a lot of bombardment, say, for the senses. There's not so much happening. So we can really start to see what's most of value. And I think it's the same in my relationships. You know, I'm sort of connecting with the people who are closest to me in ways that I've maybe neglected through the project and being very busy with various things. And also the kind of emails that I'm receiving and sending to my mom. You know, I got a very beautiful, really moving email just telling me how much she loves me and is proud of me. And, you know, the kind of email that's not that common it's also not that rare in our family we're, we're very nice to each other from a distance i have to say <laughs> but the point is that it it causes us to start to value each other much more you know especially when we don't see each other so these are all ways of preparing a foundation for the practice of loving kindness so the buddha says and it's always chanted as well in the um, ordination chant um let me get the Pali. Um, Sila Paribhavito Samadhi Mahapala Mahani Samso, which means the Samadhi that's empowered by virtue is of great fruit and great benefit. Yeah? So this means not jumping steps in the noble path, not just trying to force your way into deep meditation, but really making those foundations strong through, again, this practice of loving kindness in daily life. Yeah, so if you imagine that you want to build a building, you know, what kind of building is going to be most um, lasting and stable and uh, earthquake proof? It's going to be a building with a very deep foundation, but also quite a wide foundation. Yeah, the wider the foundation, the higher you're going to be able to get that building. If it's just on a skinny foundation, even if that foundation is deep, you can get a certain height, but it won't be as high in the end. I guess that's why they made pyramids the way they did. They have a really rock solid foundation. And same thing with trees. You know, trees are another example. You imagine the roots just going really deep into the earth. And the deeper and the wider they go, the taller and the more steady that tree will be. You know, so we have to make this as a foundation. And the other thing is that it helps us to integrate our practice. You know, it's kind of depressing to sometimes meet meditators who claim to attain this and that. And then you see them in the daily life and they're full of anger, competition, arrogance about it. And, you know, the sense of self is still very strong, even sometimes empowered by, <laughs> by the meditation because they've come into it with too much will, too much force, and not enough letting go, not enough giving. Yeah. So this virtue is about giving. So these are the foundations, but how do we know when we're ready to really start cultivating loving kindness? And there's one place in the suttas, there's probably more than one, where the Buddha said that you're ready if the hindrances do not obsess the mind. So it's not that we should have overcome them completely, otherwise we'd already be in deep meditation. But we should be at the point where the hindrances, the craving, the ill will or anger, irritation, frustration, doubt and confusion, um, restlessness, worry, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, are not so strong as we can't sit down, and we've got to do battle with that. You know, hopefully we've overcome the coarser ones, and now when you sit on your cushion, it's just a matter of overcoming the more refined hindrances and obstacles to deep meditation. Yeah, so that's the time when we're ready, and I think this is really important for all of us now because in our daily practice, I mean, I would definitely encourage you to have a meta practice. And to do something, you know, to do some meta practice every day, whether it's a formal sitting or part of a sitting at the beginning, at the end, or maybe just going to bed, waking up, maybe just washing your hands, whatever it is. But to know that, you know, that you need to know what state of mind you're in and whether your mind's ready to practice it. If you're very agitated, it's maybe not the time to do it. But if your mind's fairly calm and feeling fairly at ease, then you can try yeah, so why is metta as a samadhi practice so effective? I just wanted to go through this in <clears throat> the way that I've sort of thought about it through my own experience. And um, I think the first reason is because it helps to purify our minds from ill will and aversion, which is probably the most pervasive um, sort of sticky hindrance, you know. And it doesn't necessarily mean um, anger or um, feeling particularly 
irritable or <clears throat> finding yourself that it's difficult to get along with people for me it's not usually a problem with getting along with people so I don't have a lot of ill will to others but I do notice that there's some ill will towards myself at times I'm much harder on myself than others and it can also be ill will to one's emotional world or to situations in life that we don't really like or even more so it can be a very subtle ill will towards your meditation and I think this is really um, sort of pernicious and is that the right word pernicious and um, and and sometimes not noticed for many years that you have this subtle kind of struggle with your inner experience and especially with breath meditation people can get into a bit of a battle like it goes off pull it back it goes off pull it back and you find the breath kind of boring and you know uninteresting and tiring and the breath then becomes a bit coarse and you just can't settle with that breath because you have a kind of negativity towards it and this is a very subtle hindrance of ill will so the buddha says that uh, metta is the best antidote to ill will and further than that it cannot coexist with a mind of love you know so the more metta you have in your heart the more loving kindness is present at that time at any particular time because it will change um the less ill will can coexist with that yeah so this is the first reason that meta practice is so powerful and one of the signs that your meta practice is working <clears throat> is that you actually feel relieved from that ill will it's also a sign that there was some ill will if you're starting to get sort of bliss coming up and happiness coming up it's suggesting that there was some ill will there that was blocking you from that beforehand so not to judge it but to show you where your obstacles are and then the other two the second one really that i wanted to draw on is um that there are specific aspects of metta that samadhi practice can help to bring about so the first one is a kind of um making the quality of metta really sink into the heart like really get embedded and deeply rooted in the heart so when we practice metta again and again, you know, and use it as a, um, a frequent practice, maybe not our main one, some people take it as their main one, um, <clears throat> these qualities of loving kindness start to sink into the heart and almost shape our character. Yeah, there's a sutta, I think it's number 20 in the Majjhima Nikaya, and well, it might be number 19, yeah maybe it's number 19 and the buddha says that whatever we frequently reflect and ponder upon becomes the inclination of our mind yeah so it becomes like our dwelling place that's why metta is called one of the brahma viharas and vihara literally means an abode a dwelling a kind of resort that we can frequent and so this metta becomes a place we can go back to again and again and it becomes an abode for us an abiding a very pleasant and beautiful abiding yeah and then the other thing is that it brings about repeated practice brings about this boundless extension yeah so it becomes immeasurable or limitless and i wanted to just quote a little poem about that relating to um becoming limitless in terms of the people we can accept yeah and this is a poem that was put up on my teacher Ajahn bram's website when he was um delisted for ordaining nuns fully ordaining nuns uh, 2009 that happened for anyone who's not aware and uh, he got kind of uh, I mean he some people say kicked out excommunicated but basically he wasn't allowed to associate himself with all the other branches of the Thai forest um, tradition like Amravati and Chehurst and other places and there was this very lovely poem that was on his website and it said um, they drew a circle to shut me out rebel heretic a thing to flout but love and I had the wit to win. We drew a circle that took them in. <laughs> Which I think is really lovely, a little bit cheeky, but also just really beautiful, you know, if you can't, uh, if you're excluded, just don't allow yourself to exclude those who excluded you, yeah? The Buddha said, people argue with me, but I don't argue with the world. So can we be someone without that contention who can include all beings, even those we don't like, or perhaps who have harmed us in some way because they only do that when they're suffering or maybe they don't realize they're harming us we can also extend our experience in terms of the experiences that sorry widen our heart in terms of um, the experiences that we're willing to accept yeah 
I mean, right now we are, we basically have no choice but to accept that there's a global pandemic and that many of us are, you know, self-isolating or at least living very, very um, reduced lives. We're not going out and about, hopefully, and meeting um, all our friends and family members and, you know, risking the spread even further of this virus. So, you know, this isn't a situation that we've ever had to kind of meet or include in our circle. But... In that sense, we can widen to embrace even that and see what potential lies there for us to learn from, you know, because there will be ways that we learn as individuals and hopefully as societies as well to live a more harmless and gentle life that doesn't cause so much um, harm, especially to animals and to, um, to the vulnerable. Hmm? And we can also widen our hearts in terms of emotions. What kind of emotions are we willing to embrace? Yeah. This is often a common question for meditators. They say, oh, I'm getting all this um, anger or, you know, I'm feeling really bad. How can I overcome it? And I often say, well, you know, be careful before you want to overcome it because before we actually are able to let go, we have to understand it. We have to meet it, right? How can you understand something you haven't yet met? It's like you want to learn about a person who you've never met. You first have to befriend them and get to know them, right? If you've never actually seen that, that very clearly, then your letting go will be very superficial at best, but also you'll be missing out on great insights that could have come through understanding those emotions more deeply. So finding ways to meet and embrace our emotional world is also an aspect of loving kindness. And then another aspect of metta, which is about its extension, is that it can spread in all directions. So as we did in the little meditation now, you know, we spread it to all kinds of people um, across the globe, rich or poor, human or non-human, etc., etc., etc. And um, in the early Buddhist suttas, it also talks about the four directions. So the Buddha says that like a trumpet, if you're on a mountaintop, I'm not sure of the exact words he uses, but I always imagine it's like in Tibet where they have these really high Himalayas and you have all these beautiful monasteries built on top of the most precarious looking rocks. And they're often quite open, you know, so there might be a, a Dhamma hall, which is kind of open air. And they play these huge trumpets as part of the ceremony. Not like my little bell, but really. And they spread across the whole valley. You know, the entire valley. And the Buddha says in the same way, loving kindness can spread like a trumpet across <clears throat> all directions. So it re that sound reaches everybody, regardless of who those people are. And then another aspect of its boundless extension, this limitlessness of love, relates to the mind itself, the heart itself. Yeah. So the Buddha says that somebody with a heart of loving kindness or you know, when the mind is purified from these hindrances, one's mind becomes mahagata, right? Which literally means it has gone to greatness. It's become great. It's become big, boundless, vast. So it's the mind itself actually seems bigger. It can include more. And I've had experiences, you know, in my meditation where um, it's really interesting to notice that a mind with loving kindness doesn't re react in the same way to maybe traumatic memories or irritating sounds around you. There's a simile um, of a salt crystal, again, in the suttas. I love to refer to the suttas. And the Buddha says, you know, if you have like a glass of water and you put a salt crystal in it, can you drink that water? You know, I mean, a big salt crystal, right? Um, that, that water in the glass becomes incredibly salty. But if you put that same size crystal in a lake, can you notice the salt? You wouldn't even notice it, right? And I've had this sort of experience where a person who was definitely on the category of a difficult person for me, who's, um, who did something actually that caused a lot of trauma every time I recollected it. Um, and so I didn't, I didn't intentionally practice metta for this person for a couple of years because I just didn't think it was wise to bring the person who'd caused this trauma into my mind. It wasn't helpful for me because the healing wasn't, <clears throat> hadn't happened yet. But one day I was meditating and the metta was really quite strong <clears throat> towards a best friend. And um, the thought of this person came up in my mind and it really was like that salt crystal in a lake. It just didn't have an impact. 
It was as though it just dissolved into this flow of loving kindness. Without an impact, it didn't impede that flow and that flow just continued. You know, I didn't even need to take her as the main object because it felt like she was included there as that meta became more and more boundless. And you may think that was only for that session, but it was incredible because after that, I mean, it wasn't completely gone. The trauma wasn't absolutely absent, but I could start to talk and think about her without getting triggered, without getting that sense of <gasps> something went really wrong. And the healing just, yeah, was catalyzed really quick. I mean, from there on, there was almost no problem anymore at all. And uh, it didn't mean that I saw this person again. I mean, she's, I think, on the other side of the world anyway. Um, but I'm confident that if I did, I would have a heart of loving kindness, which would also be protective. It wouldn't mean becoming best friends again, you know, because Meta doesn't leave us like a vegetable. Oh, you can just do whatever you want to me, you know. That's not loving kindness. Loving kindness is a protection. Yeah, the Buddha actually says it protects you from fire, weapons, um, danger, as of all different kinds. So, oh yes, gosh, these talks are always longer than I expect, but I wanted to talk about the other special attribute of metta that makes it so effective as a samadhi practice. And that is just the, the pure pleasure of it, the pure happiness that's associated with feelings and emotions of loving kindness. Now, often teachers will make the point fairly strongly that loving kindness is not just an emotion, it's not only a pleasant feeling. And that's true because as we explained, it can be an intention, it can be an action of thought, of body or deed rather. You know, you don't have to feel good necessarily. Sometimes giving is actually a hard thing to do and you don't feel good at the time, but you do it because it's the right thing to do. So it is not always co-joined with a, a good or pleasant feeling, but in the cultivation of it, it does tend to engender those feelings of warmth and relaxation, softness, um, what we call PT, which goes through the body. I don't know if you know that word, joy and rapture. Yeah. And again, you know, the Buddha was saying very clearly in, throughout the suttas that deep states of stillness depend on happiness. And happiness is the proximate cause for these states of stillness to arise. Yeah. And this is shown again and again in the sequence of meditation. In some places in the sutta, the meditation sequence actually starts with suffering, which I find really validating and incredibly liberating that we can actually start a path of liberation from the place of suffering and that's because of the compassion that can arise and the faith in the buddha's teaching the confidence that can arise through realizing that yes there's suffering and there's a cause for that there's also a path that leads us out of suffering yeah so this can be the cause for confidence to arise and as a result of that for us to stop practicing sila because we now we have an incentive we don't want to cause more harm through our you know actions in life and from there he says from either the confidence or from the sila that the joy starts to arise that's called pamoja you know and this can be just the wholesome joy of living a good life of having a pure heart or even just a lack of remorse a lack of feeling bad about yourself yeah we often don't notice that kind of subtle happiness, but it is there if you look for it. And then, um, and then after the joy arises, the piti arises, which is a, in a way a more refined version and often felt in the body, sort of like um, it can be like a shower or like um, it can be like, um, I forget what they call it in the Visuddhi Magga, but it's like it can just sort of, for me, it sort of sometimes comes across my head just like vroom, like a very quick sort of flash of, of joy or of pleasure. And other times it can be very gentle and sort of settle into the whole body. Um, and this is a very important step on the, on the path into deep meditation. And it's also one of the steps in uh, breath meditation. And one of the steps that's often missed by meditators, because like I said before, the breath can appear quite boring. But when we have metta along with the breath, or when we do metta before practicing breath meditation, you can like get a jump start on the breath meditation. I mean, I often do this on a retreat. I do a lot of metta practice before I go to the breath so that by the time I'm with the breath, my mind's very receptive, very um, able to feel the subtle pleasure of the breath, even just the relaxation relaxing quality of the breath and there's already a sense of piti there a sense of rapture that keeps my mind with the breath quite easily without any force 
So this really helps to get into that state. And from there, the body and the mind become tranquil. And then the Buddha said, Sukha arises, which is a deep sense of contented happiness. And after that, you have a chance to get into the deep states of stillness. So these deep states are sort of empowered by the pleasure, by a different kind of pleasure that's very um, separate from the sense world, but it's an inner happiness and inner peace and tranquility. Yeah, Ajahn Brahm often calls it the, the bliss of peace, which is very beautiful. And, um, and so then the mind gets settled. So this is very different from concentration, right? It's very different. So it's not supposed to be, <laughs> I'm just choosing his words again. It's like I'm brainwashed by my teacher. He did that on purpose. But yeah, he always says meditation shouldn't be a concentration camp, <laughs> which is what it is if you're trying to concentrate too much, right? It's supposed to be a meditation camp, not a concentration camp. Not very PC, probably. <laughs> so this is a little bit of why I think meta practice is so helpful and the sort of benefits you can get. Of course, in the suttas, the Buddha also talks about, um, he talks about mundane benefits too, so-called mundane benefits, but it's worth mentioning that um, meta practice helps us to sleep well. It helps us to sleep easily, dream good dreams and wake up fresh. It protects us from... Um, fire and uh, weapons and poisons apparently I'm not sure about the the, um, the virus but it may because by staying inside due to loving kindness you will less likely catch the virus so there you go that's why I'm in <laughs> and um, and also he says that uh, you become dear to human beings and to devas and I was thinking about that earlier you know, because I'm in a position now where I am alone. And I was thinking, you know, it also makes you dear to yourself. It's much, much easier to live with yourself and to be with yourself if you have that sense of love and kindness towards yourself. Yeah. This afternoon I was meditating and uh, something arose for me, some emotion arose where I really felt like a sense of tightness in my heart, like, like, mm, like emotional, not exactly grief, but pain, sort of a, a, a deep pain and hurt in my heart. And I was just practicing loving kindness with that and, you know, expanding my awareness, letting it be there, making sure that my attitude towards it was, um, was gentle and kind, not an attempt to get away from it. And uh, the words just came to me. The words that came in my mind were something like, you're with someone who really cares for you. And I just said that to myself a couple of times, you know, you're with someone who really cares. Because of course I care for me. I mean, I'm a nun here and normally I would have guests and, you know, now I don't have guests, but there's a special provision in the Vinaya, thank goodness, that allows uh, monastics to cook for themselves when um, there's no other choice, basically. It says in times of famine or danger or difficulty. So this is one of those times. And I know my teacher, Ajahn Brahmali, he's been advising various senior monks to do the same thing, who are also in isolation alone. And, you know, just the fact that I cook for myself and I always try to make it nourishing and tasty, that's an indication of my own self-care, you know. And I also think it's a beautiful way to develop self-care. And if you look closely at like, your life, you will see that you do try to make choices that are good for you. We do care for ourselves, even though we may still, you know, niggle over our faults. We do have a sense of self-care and love and kindness. And that really helped me today, you know, just to kind of give this space and... Um, yeah, it's sort of passed, but it's also left me like a bit tender and in a more kind of gentle mood. And I think that's okay. You know, I don't mind showing up like that. <laughs> I actually find there's great strength in being able to like integrate all these feelings and allow them in. And then obviously in daily life, the meta practice has benefits living with others. Yeah, as I said, a motivation for the goodness that we do, for the kind acts that we perform, rather than just fear of a terrible rebirth. You know, loving kindness is a great motivation. And in the end, you know, it's, uh, it feeds into wisdom because loving kindness helps you to see, you know, that we are basically all conditioned by our experiences, by our... Um, <clears throat> upbringing by the people that we associate with and even these states of loving kindness themselves the buddha says are volitionally produced in other words they're conditioned we can bring them into existence and at some point they pass away you know they don't last forever and it's not complete freedom from suffering 
but it will get us to the point of deep samadhi from where we have a chance to really see things as they are and to actually penetrate the truths of impermanence and suffering and non-self at a level that really does free the heart. So I think metta can take us all the way, right from our basic motivation to practice <clears throat> through pleasant meditations, which benefit ourselves and other beings, you know, into service and active community roles, meaningful ways to connect with each other <clears throat> and into these deep meditations. Yeah. From where we really have a chance to, um, yeah, to make a full end of suffering. And I do have great confidence that that's possible. And that there are people alive who have done that and who continue to inspire me very much. So may we all gain inspiration and may we all incorporate a little bit more loving kindness into our lives of practice. Okay, so I'm going to stop the record button.